This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church, 5255 South Linden Road, Swartz Creek, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by George Etheridge. Salvation is for all. Our scripture reading is Romans chapter 10 verses 5 through 15 and it reads, Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your hearts, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved but how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in the one of whom they have never heard and how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him and how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Today's scripture is in the middle of Paul's extended wrestling with the fate of his fellow Jews as they continue to seek their righteousness through the law rather than through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul wants them to seek salvation in Christ rather than the law. Our scripture is an expansion of Romans 10:4 where Paul states that Christ is the end of the law. Paul uses scripture to show us how Christ is the end, the termination, the fulfillment, and the purpose of the law. First, with the coming of Christ, the function of the law as the means of reconciliation with God has come to an end. In its place is Jesus Christ. Paul demonstrates this by weaving Christ into Old Testament passages about the law. Paul quotes Leviticus 18.5, which places the burden of salvation on human fulfillment of the law. Then Paul quotes Deuteronomy 30 uh, verses 11 and 12, which says, Surely this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you. 
nor is it far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and yet and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. In Paul's creative use of these passages where the law, the commandments once stood, Paul now puts Christ in that place. This passage from Deuteronomy ends with the declaration that the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. From Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. When Moses talks about the word, he's referring to the commandments, the law. In place of the law, Paul inserts Christ. We do not need to go to heaven to know God. God has come to us in the form of Christ who is near to us, as close as our hearts and our mouths. Christ has replaced the law as the way of salvation. With the coming of Christ, the law no longer serves the function of reconciling humans with God. In fact, the law has become an obstacle to salvation. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me, according to Paul in Romans chapter 7, verse 10. Martin Luther knew this as well. He too tried to achieve salvation, well, not by strictly adhering to the Torah, but by strict adherence to the medieval pillars of sacrament and cooperating um, grace. Like Paul, Luther found that what had once promised life brought only more doubt, despair, and death. So both men understood that in one sense, the coming of Jesus represents the termination of the law as the primary means of reconciliation and of righteousness. Jesus is the end of the law in that he has fulfilled the very function of the law. He has reconciled humans to our Lord. As John Calvin says, Christ is the meaning, the authority, the fulfiller, and the way to the fulfillment of the law. He is himself the righteousness before God, the divine justification that everyone is to receive and can receive through faith. So how does the law function after Christ? Theologians see a threefold function of the law. The law serves to condemn us of our sinfulness. The law functions to restrain us from being evildoers. But it not only restrains evildoers and reveals human sinfulness, it serves as the best instruction for enabling us us believers, daily to learn with greater truth and certainty what that will of the Lord is which we aspire to follow. In other words, the law is still good. As Paul says in Romans seven twelve. the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good because we have a God who is faithful and constant. Those moral laws that pleased God in the times of the Israelites 
continue to guide us in God's will, even with the coming of Christ. In this sense, the law does not terminate with Christ. It still has its role in our Christian lives. In fact, Christ himself was the only human being who was capable of upholding and obeying the deeper meaning of the law. With a few exceptions, all Torah commands have to do with one of two primary relationships, human to human and God to human. So Christ showed us what the law was intended to do and be. He was in harmony with God the Father, and he showed pure agape love to his fellow human beings. You see, he lived the life the Torah was designed to create. Finally, Christ is the very purpose of the law. The law was given in order to join humans and God. And with the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ, the purpose of the law has been achieved. God and humanity have been united. So in light of what Christ has done, what is our role in this Christian life? Paul says that we are to share the good news that salvation is for all. Evangelism or sharing the good news is something that must always happen in context. There's no one size fits all approach. Some of us are comfortable doing mission and consider it to be the most acceptable form of evangelism. While others of us are more comfortable going out and talking about faith, even in public, even in non-church places, even though we, these are different, both forms of evangelism, social justice on the one hand, and witnessing one's faith are equally valid. The tension around evangelism is not from the methods employed, but rather from the motivation. The tension is between doing and believing. But again, it's not so much that doing and believing, it's more about what motivates us. Those of us who feel that by our actions we can save others, whether it's by our good works or our persuasive words, we have missed the mark. You see, Paul offers a gentle correction to us who would bring Christ to others. He reminds us that Christ is already present. It is not us to us to save the world. God has already done that. It is up to us to believe that this is true and live as though we believe. You know, we can't save others by our actions alone. Some of us are comfortable with this, though. We see it as permission for us to sit back and let God do the work of salvation. It feels like an easy way out. Others of us find the whole discussion of salvation to be old-fashioned and not especially relevant for the complex issues facing the church and the world in this 21st century. 
we skip over this to get to what we see as the substance of making a difference in practical ways. For many of us Christians though, a thoughtful consideration of Paul's teaching raises big questions. If God in Christ has already done it all, then what are we supposed to do? What is our purpose in the world? What does it mean to confess with our lips and to believe in our hearts? For us questioning Christians, it's important to understand that neither our private piety nor our street corner sermons will do. What the, Paul, what the Apostle Paul is urging is a life of internal and external authenticity, a life based on faith. We may not be able to change anything, but faith, faith can change everything. This Christian faith creates an entirely new geometry. The circle of believers that once was defined by its boundaries, the law, is now defined by its center, Christ. The attention to who is in and who is out is no longer the focus. Rather, the focus is on the one who calls, the one who claims, the one who redeems, the one who loves us. We are called to start in the center and live knowing the circle is infinite. This radical, Radical inclusion incorporates all who believe, however they express that belief. The infinite circle wraps around those who speak and witness, showing their faith with their lips, and those who pray and ponder, practicing their faith in their hearts. Jews and Greeks alike are in because no one is out. God's generosity extends to all. We who are made in the image of God are to be generous as well. Just as no one has a monopoly on the gracious abundance of the Lord's love, so those who know that love in our very being are to ensure that others know that as well. Faith is an embodied reality. You heard Paul, he speaks of lips and mouth and heart and feet. The way for us as believers to explain God to those who have not heard is not through our theological brilliance, our spiritual proofs, or our doctrine, or our dogma. Instead, it is for each of us to live out the word that is within us and do that in a way that makes sense and is truthful. We are to frame our message so that it can be understood human to human, somebody to another body. For some of us, this means witnessing to our own faith by speaking about it or by engaging in actions that proclaim that faith in a concrete way. In either case, the instruction of scripture is clear. 
those who believe are to be messengers of the good news of faith. Commentator uh, Mary Beth Anton tells the story of a woman in her church who was turning 50. And in an effort to uh, celebrate the occasion, the woman's husband offered to give her a grand party. She began making plans, but after a while, she was troubled by the expense and the fuss and how all of this was going to be dedicated to her birthday. So instead of a party for herself, she and her family threw a Thanksgiving feast for the members of the church and its neighborhood including the community who gathered nightly to share their meal at a local soup kitchen. She hired uh, the best country western band in West Texas. On the night of the party, all were welcome, both neighbors who had never darkened the doors of a church and lifelong members. Everyone sat around the tables eating and listening together as the band played old time gospel hymns. Following the dinner, uh, Jody Nick and his Texas Cowboys cranked it up. Before long, the wooden dance floor at the front, front of the fellowship hall was fill, filled with dancing couples, both young and old, members and neighbors, dancing and laughing together. Mary says that she doesn't know if anyone was converted that night, but Jesus was present and introduced all around. She does know that several who had never been to church before are now attending worship regularly on Sunday mornings. Because of the party, the members of the church have renewed their efforts to welcome visitors into their midst. The scripture says, how are they to believe in the one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to become acquainted with, get to know, believe in, and confess one whom they've never had the chance to really meet? For Paul and with Paul, we must commit ourselves to evangelism. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Because Christ is the termination of the function of the law. Because Christ is the fulfillment of the function of the law. Because Christ is the perfect adherence to the law. Our job, yours and mine, is to tell others human beings need only believe in their heart and confess with their lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And with that, we will be united eternally with the beloved community of God. My brothers and sisters, each of us can decide for ourselves whether we will confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. This is the good news of Jesus Christ that saves. God's promises are life in the spirit, eternal life through a relationship with God, and victory in Christ. Through faith and baptism, we receive a new identity, a new relationship, a life in the spirit. 
And God has promised that we will grow in newness of life. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for providing the way of faith and salvation, the way of eternal life, a new identity as your child. Thank you for the power of your good news. Thank you for inviting us to be your partners in mission and ministry. Thank you for equipping us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, teach us to show love and concern for others in the ways we, and the things we say and the things we do. Lord, teach us to trust you and depend on you and share your good news. Lord, protect us, guide us, forgive us. We pray that you replace our fear with faith and courage. Replace our sickness with your healing. Lord, replace our sadness, our anxiety, our fear with your joy and your peace and in your and your hope. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.